ESPN College Football presented by Xfinity. And here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, inside the heart of Bryant-Denny Stadium, we're reminded how the college football world was turned upside down a week ago when it was announced star quarterback Tua Tunga Bailoa would miss the rest of the season. No question his presence has been missed in the Alabama locker room this week, and especially on the field as the Crimson Tide push for another playoff appearance. Well, the injury took place a week ago in Starkville, Mississippi, led by the dislocated hip, the broken nose, and a concussion. During the game, Tua Tunga Bailoa was airlifted to Birmingham, Alabama, when Sunday he flew on to Houston for surgery on the dislocated hip on Monday before finally returning to T-Town just yesterday. It's been an emotional week in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Lauren Sisler has much more. Boy, there has been a tremendous amount of support for Tua Tonga Bailoa. We've seen it on social media, and we've certainly seen it here in Tuscaloosa. And how about this? 1,123 cards of support have poured in for Tua when he arrived here on campus yesterday, with more than 1,000 showing up in the mail later in the afternoon. So we are well over 2,100 letters and cards from fans and supporters and still coming in. I've also been in touch with Tua's parents, Nalu and Diane, this week. His dad sharing some updates along the way. And one thing that has not wavered is their faith. Tua has been in great spirits and wanted nothing more than to get back from Houston following his surgery to be home with the rest of his family and with his football team. What an emotional moment here in Bryant-Denny as Tua reappears here on the playing surface. On senior day, no less, as Western Carolina's in town in the annual tune-up before the Iron Bowl next week against Auburn. Well, great to have you with us, as always, alongside of Kelly Stopper. I am Roy Philpott. Tua Tunga Bailoa off the field, one thing. On the field, a transcendent quarterback. That is a perfect word, transcendent. He came here immediately kind of performing and existing outside of what the normal range is. On the field is one thing. We know his skill set. The question now for this program is, when Tua isn't that locker room presence, what did they do to fill that void? That's what the undertaking is about starting today. Enter Mac Jones making just his second career start. The former backup, now the starter. Yeah, Mac Jones wasn't exactly someone they took off the top shelf and he tried out for the football team. He's a scholarship quarterback one of the top 10 in 2017. He actually decommitted from Kentucky and chose to come here knowing that Jalen Hurts was already here. Tua was on his way. This is a confident young man, and this game today is about getting Mac Jones acclimated to his new surroundings. An emotional week for Nick Saban. Alabama won the coin toss and has elected to receive with Tua looking on. Catamounts of Western Carolina out of the Southern Conference coming in at three and eight. Short kick by Pletz, fielded by Jalen Waddell. World-class speed for number 17 in Crimson. And ushered out of bounds near the 45-yard line. Who is he? Mac Jones from Jacksonville, Florida, the redshirt sophomore. Kelly mentioned the decommitment from Kentucky he was actually a member of the 2016 Elite 11 group as a finalist. First career start against Arkansas last month. Extremely efficient in that outing, 18 of 22 for three touchdowns, and you see the yards. Yeah, and this game is completely different because he woke up Sunday morning, did Mac Jones knowing that he was now the quarterback that was handed the keys to this car at Alabama. They'll pitch it. Devontae Smith, the junior receiver, sent out in plus territory by Reggie Jones and a quality pickup. You know, Roy, the thing that Mac Jones told us yesterday I think resonated with me is on his recruiting trip, he sent down with Nick Saban, and Nick Saban said quarterbacks at Alabama don't have to be exceptional. They play with exceptional players. And so that's the order of the day for Mac Jones and going forward is to distribute the football to tremendous playmakers. Najee Harris on the inside give. On second and two, he'll gain three for a first down for the tie. Speaking of those playmakers, Najee Harris may be chief among them. Hope the wagon to the pass game 
Najee Harris is that spark provider, has been all year for this offense. One of the top running back prospects in the country some three years ago. Brilliant spin move a couple of times. That'll result in a gain up to the 40. The stop by Jones. And it'll bring up second down. The impact players for Alabama, we just talked about Nazi Harris. He's the spark provider, and he wants that workload with Tua out. And Jermichael White is a very productive, really an eraser of mistakes on the back end for Western Carolina. First passing attempt for Jones, breaking open is Smith towards the end zone and incomplete. A late flag on the field. White was in coverage. Let's check the penalty. Lee Hedrick, our official today, this veteran SEC crew. Pass interference on the defense, number 22. 15-yard penalty from the previous spot, automatic, first down. Devontae Smith was getting vertical, and Jermichael White is more of a safety that gets down in the box and gets physical. You don't want that type of matchup, and Tua certainly likes it early here in Tuscaloosa. Uh, what an uplifting spirit Tua Tonga Bailoa has been for this team this week, and talked to so many different players and coaches Despite his suffering, he really has been there for a lot of his teammates. The screen to Waddle. And bottled up after picking up another tied first down. So, Roy, think of Mac Jones as a point guard. Distribute the football to a gaggle of NFL-style wide receivers and turn around and hand the ball off to Najee Harris. That's exactly what Mac Jones needs to do starting today as... The guy who is in control of the game plan and going forward, certainly at Auburn next week. Iron Bowl, of course, already a hot topic of conversation as Harris is pummeled after a short pickup. I like what Tua Tunga Bailoa told Mac this week, and Mac told us yesterday, every time I see Tua, he says my full name. What's up, Mac Jones? Mac Jones. And Tua told him, you got this, bro, in a FaceTime conversation from the hospital in Houston. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, that was good stuff. He said... Mac Jones, go do you. And that's exactly what Mac Jones, he's not Tua. Don't try to be that guy. By the way, no pressure on Jones. Alabama right in the mix for another appearance in the playoff. And according to what metric you like, they really have a legitimate shot. We'll talk about that as we go through the afternoon. But Mac Jones has to play well, yeah. has to look the part this week, and especially next week against Auburn down at Jordan-Hare. And the college football playoff committee is not forward looking but style points will matter as the committee takes a look at this Alabama offense with Mac Jones taking the snaps for the rest of this season third down and seven Jones with a clean pocket surveys and fires incomplete looking for his tight end major Tennyson that'll bring up fourth down and that was an early really conservative throw Tennyson was one-on-one -on -one breaking to the out route in the corner of the end zone and there's a window here and that ball simply needs to be put on the big body of the tight end decent coverage by Brandon number nine but that ball was there to be completed an early missed throw by Mac Jones Joseph Bullibus on for the 29 yard field goal attempt and Bama draws first blood 3-0, 1144 to go in our first quarter. And coming up next for the first time, Tua Tunga Bailoa in his own words with our Lauren Sisler. ESPN College Football is presented by Xfinity. Get the ultimate in-home Wi-Fi experience with Xfinity X5. And in part by Kia. This holiday season, hurry in to get a great deal at your local Kia dealer. Here in Tuscaloosa, you're watching the SEC on ESPN. Senior day, marking the final time these players would take the field at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Annual tune-up before the Iron Bowl is Joseph Bullibus. Sends it to Caleb Ferguson, who waves for the fair catch. Catamounts with their first possession coming up. 
of the afternoon, Tyree Adams, the Western Carolina quarterback from St. Petersburg, Florida, the redshirt senior. Played a little basketball, ran some track and field in high school, the career leader in Western Carolina history in passing yards and touchdowns, ranking inside the top five of the Southern Conference in those categories. He's got to play well this afternoon to give the Catamounts a chance, Kelly. Yeah, and a dual threat type of guy in the system that Western Carolina runs offensively is the modern day triple option from the gun. We'll see how that young defense for Alabama defends that today. Catabounce, 0 and for a lifetime against the Tide as Christian Barmore wraps up Donovan Spencer after a short game. So the modern day triple option from the gun is a zone run typically inside and then the quarterback Tyree Adams getting to the edge in some form and either pitching it to a running back or you could have the third option actually being a pass out on the perimeter. Western Carolina known for its up-tempo attack until recent weeks injuries have halted that. And a brief pause in the action due to an injury timeout. Isaiah Helms requiring assistance as we step aside. Snow. Wonderful tribute paid to Tua Tunga Vailoa here at Bryant Denny Stadium. Tears already flowing on the sideline after going through hip surgery just this past Monday in Houston. And alongside of Henry Ruggs, who's out today with rib injury. Great scene in Tuscaloosa for one of the all-time greats, and that's saying something at Alabama. Kelly Stopper, Lauren Sisler, Roy Philpott here in Tuscaloosa. Play action for Adams, who flings it. Pass will be caught by the tight end. That's a first down for Western Carolina's Clayton Bardall. And he rumbles into Alabama territory before being stopped by the senior, Jared Maiden. That's a gain of 28. And a nice job of Adams getting out of harm's way, out to the edge. The mesh inside invited those linebackers up, and then the tight end comes across cross on the crossing route and does a great job of just getting into that open space. That's going to be one of the challenges for Crimson Tide defensively is to discern this scheme that they haven't seen a lot of this season. Inside handoff, quality pickup for Spencer. Who's seeking the stop, that'll bring up second down. people thinking ahead to the college football playoff where does Alabama currently fit into that race certainly tied have to win the next two to have a shot a lot of work to do to have that opportunity for head coach Nick Saban We'll fake it to Nate Mullen with time is Adams and the pass is going to be intercepted. Xavier McKinney picked it off. Western Carolina actually had an opportunity here. Donovan Spencer, the running back, was running right down the seam. And McKinney recovers late and makes a spectacular play on the football. He's on the opposite side to begin with. Spencer, the running back, is going to go right down the seam. Initially, McKinney was actually fooled when he was thinking of running to the, to the hash on the left side and then recovers, actually a spin move, and the ball ends up right in his chest. Spectacular athletic play by McKinney. Second pick of the season. Here's Mac Jones unloading one deep, looking for Jerry Judy, and it's incomplete. So we check in for the first time with Matt Berry back in the studio. Okay, gentlemen, good afternoon. Have our L.L. Bean studio update. Checking in on Iowa and Illinois. Nate Stanley, 29 yards out of the pocket, finds Amir Smith-Marset. Good play there. Tyler Goodson then would punch it in for the Hawkeyes. Right now, Iowa up early on Illinois, 7-0. Of course, an enormous win. Kirk Ferentz last week, upsetting Minnesota. 
Golden Gophers no longer undefeated. Nifty move by Najee Harris. Stays alive. And he'll pick up another Crimson Tide first down ahead to the 44 stop by Murphy. And a great luxury to have is Najee Harris that can hit home runs. We talked about it at the open. He's really the spark provider for this offense. Even though they're NFL wide receivers out there, the spark in this offense a lot of times is Harris. Screen pass, Devontae Smith. A little shake and bake. There he goes. Devontae Smith times the end zone for another tied touchdown. From 57 yards out, the 12th touchdown grab of the season for Devontae Smith. The beauty, playing the quarterback position and taking over for the big shoes of Tua, Mac Jones can throw it out to guys like Devontae Smith. He came into this game leading the country in yards after contact. I'm not even sure he got contacted there, but throw it short to playmakers, and they run it long. Great benefit for a quarterback. First touchdown of the afternoon for Alabama, 10-0 our score. And up next, we promise our interview with Tua Tunga Bailoa. The college football team. Well, this season for every field goal and extra point made by participating universities, Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you once again, Allstate. Back in Tuscaloosa, took about 40 seconds for Alabama to score its first touchdown of the afternoon. Technically morning time, still here in the central time zone. 10 nothing our score. As Caleb Ferguson calls for the fair catch. Down to Lauren Sisler, who's with Tua. Tua, it is so great to see you and your smiling face here in the stadium. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. You know, I, I think first off, I just wanna, wanna thank, um, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for, I mean, you know, instilling the Holy Spirit in me, giving me the strength to come and support my teammates. Um, I also want to thank, you know, the fan base uh, for the amount of support that they've given me and my family, um, as well as prayers. You know, I want to thank the pastors as well, and I just want to thank my mom and dad. Um, you know, they've been helping me throughout uh, this process. You know, if I need to go use the bathroom, they help me go use the bathroom. They help me make my food. They help me go get drinks. So, um, you know, kudos to my parents, you know, for everything they've done for me up to this point. And you know, I just can't thank everyone enough for the amount of support that they've given me and my family. I don't think anyone doubted that you would be here at this football game today to support your team. What does it mean to be with your family right now? Man, I, I mean, it, it means everything, you know, whether I'm feeling good or, or not, you know, just being out here kind of uplifts my spirit, you know, and, you know, I hope it does the same for them. But. I mean, just being out here, being able to see football again, and <laughs> you know, I mean, it's 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 just it's just great. It's a great feeling. Thanks so much, Tua. All the best to you. Prayers and well wishes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Lauren, thank you very much. And you know, it's been an emotional week, not only for the Tunga Bailoa family. Face mask on the defense, number 92. 15-yard penalty will be added to the end of the run. Automatic first down. So first down for the Catamounts, but also for Nick Saban, the coaching staff, and. The Alabama fans in general, Lauren said it right out of the gate. Almost 1,100 letters had been sent here. We saw yeah, flowers being delivered to the training facility earlier in the week. And, you know, Nick Saban, give him a lot of credit. He showed a side of him we haven't seen a lot of over the years. Emotional, referencing his love for two. And it's not that he doesn't love all of his players, but there's a special bond between those two that I thought he articulated at a high level this week. After the penalty, first and ten for the Catamounts. One, two of three, despite the three and eight record. A pump fake for Adams, and there he goes with real estate. Second time today, the Catamounts are in Alabama territory. That's another first down after a gain of 12. Well, that's one of the things that defensive coordinator Peter Golding was talking to us about yesterday, Roy, is getting out of position with the young defense. He said there are times because of all the youngsters playing, including the true freshman linebackers, Christian Harris and Shane Lee, is people look around and wonder what the call is and nobody seems to have the answer. A lot of misdirection out there currently. 
Bardal in motion. Caught the pass moments ago across the middle. Connell Young picks up another quality gain on first down. That'll move the chains again as McKinney brought him down to the turf. Well, as we take a look at the impact players for Western Carolina offensively, it's Daquan Patton. He's a wide receiver, small guy. They move him around to try to create some touches. And then it's the youngsters, the true freshman linebackers and Christian Harris and Shane Lee. We were in here in week four, and they've grown up a ton since then. But a lot of growing still left to do. Christian Harris is more athletic. As they say in the business, more twitchy. And he can make up for some mistakes. Shane Lee has to be right with his eyes. We'll see how that goes today. Young in the backfield. They'll fake the handoff. Adams pushes ahead as we go back to the studio and Matt Berry. All right, guys, we kept an eye on Tanner Morgan. He was a game-time decision for Minnesota taking on Northwestern. He's in and looks good. Rashad Bateman, early touchdown for Road the Boat. And Ohio State just went 13 plays, 91 yards, 12 runs for 91 yards. J.K. Dobbins led the way. 12 runs is significant. That is a statement drive is what that is. Penn State, we're going to run it down your throat. Can you do anything about it? And that particular time, absolutely not. Buckeyes, interestingly enough, about an 18-point favorite in that game at the shoe. Play action. Pass is tipped, and it's going to be picked off far side. McKinney again, his second interception, and there he goes. Alabama to the house once again. Shaheen Carter tipped it. McKinney picked it off. Six more points on the board for the tie. Western Carolina was running a run-pass option, an RPO, and the difference is Tyree Adams doesn't see this type of recovery out of the linebacking level. And you can see that Shaheen Carter is... The safety that was up initially steps up, which is the effect that the RP is supposed to have, but it's the recovery to get back in the throwing lane, tip the ball, and McKinney once again was there to take advantage of it. Alabama striking quickly. Full of his extra point is good. 5.33 to go in a fast-moving first quarter. Got a little pick six for the tie. McKinney is second interception, and we're back in 60 seconds. Xavier McKinney, junior out of Roswell, Georgia. Two interceptions already today, three this season. All smiles for one of the leaders of the Tides defense. And a leader on the back end from that safety position that has to communicate at a higher level this season because of all the youngsters in front of him, that front seven is very, very young this year in Tuscaloosa. Ferguson calls for the fair catch. Catamounts will get it at the 25. And now for today's Wendy's Weekend Watch. Let's take a look at all the big games coming up. A lot of people have Georgia on upset alert. Yeah, A&M is getting better under Jimbo Fisher, as they did in his first year last year. I don't know that there's much of a speed bump there for LSU, however, against Arkansas. Oregon, Arizona State tonight on ABC in prime time, and the Ducks are knocking on the door of the college football playoff. And a lot of people right now, Kelly, believe Oregon wins the Pac-12 championship with just one loss and a victory over Utah, potentially. That'll be more than enough to get the Pac-12 back in the playoff. Western Carolina takes over, trailing by 17. Adams off the back foot. Rifles a pass. It's caught close to another first down. Shane Lee, the tackle. And as a tight end, Owen Kosinki makes the grab. You're Western Carolina offensively. You're just trying to find something that gives you a little bit of traction. You have to do so many things well. And I think the game plan today needs to be out on the perimeter. You obviously don't win the matchup inside. The coaches told us that they're playing offensive linemen that are freshmen trying to block Volkswagen bugs, and that certainly is the case. Jalen Young, the only receiver for the Catamounts, out of the diamond set on second and short. Not sure he got there. Christian Harris, Raylan Ingram making the stop. 
Yeah, I think even on second and short, you got to get the ball out on the edges to have a chance. Western Carolina is very young up front. And first play of the game, Isaiah Helms, the true freshman center, got dinged up. Playing freshman already, and you just simply don't win that matchup up front very often against Alabama. Third and less than a yard. Adams fakes it, flips it. Pass will be reeled in near midfield, and once again, that's Kosinki to move the chains and a gain of 17. So three drives, Kelly, for Western Carolina, all three occasions into Alabama territory. Yeah, and the task is going to be, how do you finish drives against Alabama? Kosinki is going to take advantage of the play action pass in the backfield and then just get behind the, the young defense once again. And it, we can't overemphasize that. This is a good opportunity for that young defense to be sound with their eyes. We talk about eye discipline defensively. The way Western Carolina plays offense is going to force Alabama to do just that today. Eye discipline important in the Iron Bowl next week. Straight ahead goes Spencer because you know Gus Malzahn yeah. wants to misdirection you to death potentially. It's a gain of six by Spencer as we look at Alabama's defense. The theme with Alabama's defense, I mean, they're still not giving up a lot of points. People would have you believe that it's just been something that you don't see out of the defense very often in Tuscaloosa. I don't think that's the case, but there have been some growing pains. There isn't any doubt about it, but they're incredibly young, especially in the front seven. Mullen in motion on second and four. And the inside give will make it third down and short. Jared Maiden the tackle. We were talking with Nick Saban yesterday, Roy, and it struck me as much as he's coached, he said he's never seen anything like the injuries this year because it's been really target specific on the front seven. He said, as we forecasted our front seven going into this year, there are now two guys that remain on the field out of that group. Anthony Jennings as well as Terrell Lewis are the only two remaining up front that they expected to be there this season. Third down, play action. Adams bottled up and sent down. Way back at midfield, Anthony Jennings right on cue, the fifth year senior with the sack and a loss of seven. And Jennings does a great job from the end of the line of scrimmage of containing the quarterback and that's his number one job that was another coaching point is don't get bored with your role on a particular play Anthony Jennings is supposed to check the quarterback don't get nosy with the run up inside check the quarterback and Jennings does it well right there Adams is sacked Jennings one of the seniors being honored earlier today Nick Saban talked about how important he's been battling injuries, coming up with big plays, and now a fifth-year senior and a leader for this young defense. He's been critical. That's a punt of 48 for field position for the tie. Don't forget, kick off your Sunday with NFL Countdown at 10 Eastern right here on ESPN and all-access conversation with Dak Prescott plus one-on-one -on -one with MVP contender Russell Wilson. Then on to Monday Night Football, the Ravens and Lamar Jackson. Take on the Rams, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN. ESPN Deportes in the ESPN app. And Lamar Jackson perhaps Unreal. changing the complexion of football at the next level, Kelly. Yeah, he's really one of a handful of quarterbacks currently that I think are turning the page. Youngsters that are not only playing well, but they're playing differently than quarterbacks in that league typically do. Najee Harris from the three-yard line, sent down by Trevor Childers after a short game a good situational moment right here for Mac Jones backed up you have a first down run that's not successful typically it means a second down pass but you have to understand what your team needs right here don't put the ball in harm's way but obviously distribute the ball to very gifted receivers second play for Harris on this possession lays the wood at the 10 against your Michael White that's a gain of seven yards Najee Harris is a guy that you want to depend on as a 
quarterback that's trying to get acclimated. We know that Mac Jones started against Arkansas, but he wasn't the starter yet. Tua was slated to come back at that time, and he did. But this is a different cat right now, and so Mac Jones is thinking differently, but you want to turn around and give the ball to Harris, no doubt about it. It'll be the final play. A fast-moving first quarter. A couple of Western Carolina turnovers quickly converted into Alabama points. Two is on hand. And a good start for the Tide. Still in playoff contention, leading Western Carolina out of the SoCon. 17-0 our score, 15 minutes in. Here in T-Town. Yeah, man, a lot of boats rowing in Evanston this year. That offense has been struggling. Meanwhile, here in Tuscaloosa, Crimson Tide leading Western Carolina, 17-0, starting our second quarter. Low snap was wrangled in by Jones, and Najee Harris quickly sent down by Ty Harris. That'll force a fourth down. And the ball handling from the center to the quarterback, and the ball was there. It just didn't look like it was handled by Mac Jones very well, and trust me, all eyes are on that position, probably in college football nationwide. Doing the little things right is what Mac Jones is expected to do. First punt for Alabama. And a flag will do it all over again. False start. On the offense, number 28, five-yard penalty remains fourth down. And Roy, it's interesting when you take over as the starting quarterback, you begin to have more reps with the ones than you got before. So undoubtedly, Mac Jones is taking snaps under the center by from Landon Dickerson more than he ever has. So they've been working on that to some extent, but you have to do the basic things right to begin with. Taking the snap by quarterback to center is one of those things. Off the side of the foot, Western Carolina with premium field position. Catamounts will take over in Alabama territory. And don't forget, coming up later tonight, Justin Herbert, number six, Oregon, look to keep their college football playoff hopes alive against Arizona State in beautiful Tempe, Arizona. 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC. And also the ESPN app. What a scene it will be. The Ducks on the road. And now we take a look at this week's college football playoff rankings brought to you by Capital One. Top three, really no controversy there. Georgia and Bama at four and five is where it starts to heat up a little it, bit. It really does. Certainly uh, considering what takes place going forward is what everybody wants to know. Tied, of course. We'll close with Auburn a chance for one more impressive win. Off the back foot and incomplete, trying to spot the tight end. Clayton Bardall, heavy pressure that time for the Crimson Tide. I mean, who you got right there at number four? You buying Georgia? Can buying Bama Georgia. get back in? I'm buying Georgia right now because it's not really about the loss yet. That's not the comparison with Georgia and an Alabama or all the other one losses. It's about who Georgia has beaten up to this point. And so that's why they're in the number four position. I'm with you. Problem is with Georgia, their one loss was to South Carolina at home, a program that's likely going to finish at four and eight this season. Perhaps the most stunning loss of this season for a team ranked inside the top 25. The wins, though, are impressive. Notre Dame at home, Florida in Jacksonville, on the road at Auburn. As you see some of the other one-loss teams. Yeah, and so Georgia, the separation is the wins. It isn't the loss. The losses begin to be compared to one loss when almost like the last option by the committee. You compare the, in a sense, the degree of the loss or who the loss was to. Right now, that isn't Georgia's case. They have very good wins that the other one-loss teams don't have yet. Bottom line, dogs can punch their ticket by winning the SEC championship game. Adams gets it back somehow. Lost the football again, and the Tide have recovered. Patrick Sertan, the sophomore cornerback from Florida, jumped on the loose football. This might be one of the most bizarre plays that you will see all year. It's all the window dressing, a couple of fakes by Tyree Adams, and then it was going to be a screen off to his right. 
batted back into his lap, has some green ahead of him, can potentially convert on the first down, and he gets caught from behind. A lot going on on this play. So Xavier McKinney batted the football back to Adams, then forced the yeah. fumble after already picking Adams off twice in the first quarter. Yeah, you can't coach speed, and we, we see that out of Alabama. And Western Carolina is getting indoctrinated into the speed in the SEC is unlike anywhere else in the country. Okay, you can bat the ball that the quarterback throws, and then you can tackle the quarterback later. Who does that? Number 15, apparently. What a start for Xavier McKinney. 17 0. Alabama with the lead. Guys, together? Come back to ESPN College Football, presented by Xfinity, Alabama leading Western Carolina. Quickest replay review you'll see this season, Doug Linebarger, our replay official. Clearly a fumble. Xavier McKinney. Reeled in two interceptions, forced to fumble, batted down another pass back to the Western Carolina quarterback. Told he's selling popcorn here at Bryant Denny Stadium as well. Jerry Judy wide open, brought down inside the 20. Mac Jones strikes again. Mac Jones boots slightly to his left, and Jerry Judy is running a post route going the opposite direction, con kind of contrary to the coverage in the secondary, and Mac Jones puts it right on it. Ryan Robinson checks in for the tie to running back. Late flag on the field at the 18. It's a gain of 44 yards by Jerry Judy, who most believe will be the number one receiver off the board in next year's draft. Holding on the offense, number 69. 10-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Replay, first down. We take another look at that long pass to Jerry Judy. Well designed, the semi-roll, and then Matt Jones has to readjust, climb in the pocket a little bit. A conservative throw to a fairly wide-open Jerry Judy, but again, that's who Matt Jones has to be. Just execute the design and the purpose of the play, and you have great supporting cast around you. Play action as Jones flings it. Smith makes a man miss and tackled at the 10. It was interesting getting to know Mac Jones this week. He grew up playing tennis, his family, all big tennis players. That's a gain of 17 yards. And he said, you know what? I used to have a little bit of a temper. I was the John McEnroe on the tennis court. I would smash my racket anytime a call went against me. And he said, I've kind of learned how to curtail that a little bit. Entry on the field for Western Carolina as we step aside here in Tuscaloosa. Now the Jones family extremely athletic. We told you about Mac growing up playing tennis starting at the age of five. His father Gordon, a pro tennis player. His brother played soccer at Mercer and his sister also playing tennis in college at Charleston and Sarah Jane. And he said, you know what I learned on the court no matter what happens, bad things are going to occur, and that's okay. You move on to the next sequence. You know who he, he watched to have a better temperament is Tua Tonga-Vailoa. Just observing how Tua goes about his business. Handoff using misdirection goes to Brian Robinson as we check in again with Lauren. Yeah, guys, Mac Jones really has a great rapport with his teammates, and it's so easy to see why. You guys were in the meeting room. He's got such a great personality, super easy to talk to, and he told us that nothing changes here in terms of how he handles communication with his teammates now that he's QB1. It's the same old Mac Jones, or as he says, Mac Jones, who is confident in himself and just wants to have fun with everyone around him, and even the coaches have said he's confident. They're confident in him. Don't be different. Be who you are. Yeah, I think that's a good word. Don't be different because who he is is already respected in the locker room. But trust me, Lauren, waking up Sunday morning, his paradigm changed greatly. Mechie checks in at wide receiver. Hand off to Robinson towards the pylon. Did he get there? Touchdown for the tie. Fifth touchdown of the season for Brian Robinson, the junior from right here in Tuscaloosa. 
This is going to be part of what Alabama has to present next week against Auburn, the ability to run the ball when you want to run it, not when it's dictated to you. And Brian Robinson is a very physical downhill guy as really this stable of running backs for Alabama. All of them are that. Got to believe Tigers defense, Marlon Davidson and Derek Brown will have a different vibe about him down at Jordan Hare in the Iron Bowl next week. 63 yards in six plays. Bama rolling here at home. Watching the SEC on ESPN. You saw the Southern Bank, the Black Warrior River there seconds ago. The Bryant Denny Stadium. Tide have been impressive as expected. At home against Western Carolina, the fair catch called for and made as we check in with Matt Ferry once again back in the studio. Gentlemen, Ohio State was on the doorstep of going up 14-0 in the first, but then Justin Fields coughed the ball up in the end zone. You see the replay here, ball clearly out, Penn State recovered. However, Ohio State back with the ball, still 7-0 Buckeyes. And if you're looking forward to the Iron Bowl next week, all Auburn against Sanford as expected. 14-0 over on SEC Network. Matt, I would argue the entire country looking forward to one of the great rivalries no in all of sport next week at Jordan-Hare. And Auburn handling Sanford, Alabama doing the same to Western Carolina. And, of course, Catamounts and Sanford matched up last week. Sanford won that game. Short game with a tackle by Christian Harris. Nick Saban 8-4 and four all time against Auburn in said Iron Bowl. You know that... Uh, he wants to improve the nine and four next week. Yeah, I think he does. I think that's safe to say. And it'll be an interesting matchup if you begin to look at it from that perspective. Auburn presents something really different up front than what Alabama sees a great deal. They have, Auburn does, probably the best defensive front in all of college football. That's going to be a challenge. Critical for Mac Jones to enter that contest with some momentum. Take a look at Auburn's resume. That win against Oregon really proving to be critical in the playoff race. More on that as we go through those three losses. Competitive affairs in the SEC. But that defense, you mentioned, yeah. one of the best in the nation. Yeah, and remember, Mac Jones is still getting his feet wet as the guy. And those three losses were by a total of 21 points. And so... We know that Gus Melzahn knows how to call plays, and it's a run scheme, so shorten the game a little bit in a very, very good defensive front at Auburn. We know Kevin Steele knows how to call the right kinds of plays on defense against a quarterback like Mac Jones without a ton of starting experience. That'll be his third start next week. Byron Young makes the tackle against Donovan Spencer here to bring up fourth down. And so really it's it's Gus Melzon in an intricate, complicated run game for Auburn against a really young defensive front, seven for Alabama. A lot of youngsters and a lot of moving parts on Auburn. Can they discern that? Can they keep their eyes right? And then, yeah, Kevin Steele against Mac Jones, Steve Sarkeesian against Kevin Steele. All of that's very intriguing. Another three and out for the Catamounts. Brandon Dickerson under duress. Floats it in the direction of Jalen Waddell out of bounds. We'll take a look at today's Aflac trivia question. It's always fun. When was the last time Alabama entered the postseason without a chance to win the national championship? Kelly Stopper. Your silence is deafening. Yeah, it's it's just not on the tip of my tongue currently. I'm going to go 07. I want to say that was the year Alabama defeated Colorado in the Independence Bowl, maybe. Right, like the first year of Nick Saban, they weren't in the playoff picture then. Oh, wait, it was on. Because they started that year with the resounding win against Clemson in the Georgia Dome. Najee Harris straight ahead. And he's sent down. I think it's 07. The answer, actually, the last time Alabama ah, entered the postseason without a chance to win the national championship, 2013. Wow. So six years ago, that's still a long time. 
And that was after losing to Auburn in the Iron Bowl. 11 and one regular season, and you lose the Iron Bowl. On the kick six, no less. One of the great plays in college football history. Play action for Jones. Finds his target for a first down into Western Carolina territory. Michael Murphy with a tackle after a gain of 15. Jones is a sneaky good athlete. And so you can see Steve Sarkeesian, the play caller for Alabama, is moving the pocket a little bit. I think that's foreshadowing what's going to be needed next week against that Auburn front. You can't allow that Auburn front to know where Mac Jones is going to be. So Coach Sark is moving the quarterback a little bit, and thus far, Mac Jones is handling it really well. Play action, unloading deep, looking for Waddle. Corrals it at the 12, and ushered out right there. Charles Gotti made sure he didn't score a touchdown, but the tie threatening again, and Mac Jones starting to heat up. Yeah, and Gaddy is a corner that's moved to safety against speed in James Waddle that Western Carolina simply doesn't see very often. But once again, well designed by Alabama. Using tempo, Najee Harris near side towards the end zone, across the goal line for the touchdown. Now that was too easy for the tie. Najee Harris, his 10th score of the season. I think it's Najee Harris's ability to receive the football that has really evolved in his game. First of all, does he get the ball across the plane here? I think absolutely that's a confirmed touchdown, but I think as a receiver, Harris has grown up greatly in 2019. And that certainly was a point made to us by Steve Sarkeesian this week. He's really evolved in the last four weeks. Najee Harris, the junior from California, in the passing game. He's turned out to be an incredible weapon here in Tuscaloosa. Tied on top. Always great to see Boom and TJ back in action here in Tuscaloosa. The Tide aiming for another national championship. There is work to be done, however, to have that opportunity. Including a win this week against Western Carolina. One next week in the Iron Bowl. A fair catch made by the Catamounts. Don't forget. This season, Taco Bell is celebrating student sections and passionate fans like these by awarding the Live Moss Student Section of the Year. Alabama Crimson Tide Student Section already is on the watch list. Make sure you go to ESPN.com slash Taco Bell to see how your school can compete or get the committee's attention by using the hashtag Live Moss Student Section Contest. Kelly Stopper, Lauren Sisler, Roy Philpott. Fast start for the Tide halfway through our second quarter here at Bryant-Denny Stadium. Tyree Adams back on the field, all-time leading passer in Western Carolina history. And he's been picked off a couple of times today. He'll dump it off to the tight end. Nifty move by Kosinki. He'll pick up a first down, and we check in once again with Matt Berry. All right, guys, West Virginia, Oklahoma State in the Big 12. Polk still clinging on to some, some hope there, but Jared Daigie, good toss to George Campbell for the Mountaineers right now on ESPN2 up 10-7. Man, a lot of people think Chuba Hubbard, Oklahoma State's got a chance to sneak into that Heisman conversation with the big rush numbers he's put up this year. Kelly, you buying that? I mean, there's certainly an open door there. I, I think if Joe Burrow's Heisman to lose at this point for sure. We've been wondering. I mean, Joe Burrow, the leader in the clubhouse, Justin Fields, quarterback at Ohio State, certainly a viable candidate. And then at number three, I mean, about that? where are you going? Yeah, I mean, I think Trevor Lawrence is kind of sneaking back into the conversation. It's really an open door after Joe Burrow at this point in time. I think I wanted to put Joe Burrow down there three times, but <laughs> our producer, Rob Adansky, wouldn't let me. That would kind of look like a graphical error. We don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I'm with you. It is Joe's to lose at this yeah. point. So now that we've seen it correctly, can you edit that and put Joe Burrow in there three times? <laughs> well, Chase Young, let's see what he does today. He'll blow up probably. Against Penn State, yeah. He's suspended the last two. It's a loss of three on that last run by the Catamounts. Western Carolina from the booming metropolis of Cullowee. 
North Hello. Carolina. About Sounds like a nice place. It is beautiful part of the country, the Appalachian Mountains, and about 355 miles northeast of Tuscaloosa. And head coach Mark Spear in his eighth season leading the troops. Dealt with a lot of injuries this season. Adams was suspended for a couple of games early in the year, starting quarterback. Out of the gun here, and some laundry on the field. Timeout, Western Carolina. That is their first charge timeout of the half. This will be a 30 second timeout. There is no so foul on the play. Call. There is no foul on the play. Third down and 11 coming up with 526 remaining. Here in our first half, Tua Tunga Bailoa on the sidelines after undergoing hip surgery on Monday. And you know, Kelly, it wasn't just the dislocated hip, concussion, a broken nose suffered in Starkville last week. To even show up and have the wherewithal to speak meaningful words to your teammates and the coaching staff, it's been quite impressive. It really has, and we use the word transcendent when we came on the air pertaining to Tua Tonga Bailoa, and it's as a quarterback, but it's also as the person. And you think clear back to when he was fighting for the job with Jalen Hurts, and that was the difference maker for Nick Saban is the guy that could own the locker room and affect those guys, and that was Tua Tonga Bailoa back then, and it's still who he is today. Most figuring he'll have a chance to enter the NFL draft. Adams dropped back inside the 30 by Christian Barmore. The tide flexing. Heavy pressure from Anthony Jennings as well. Boy, the thing that I think about with Tua is, you know, we talked about transcendent, but his skill set, the RPO game, really almost encouraged, if not demanded, that Nick Saban play the offensive side of the ball differently than Nick Saban had played it in the past. That's an intriguing part of this whole picture. How many people get Nick Saban to change his mind about anything? Good point. And that literally happened with the tied offense when two arrived on campus. It took some time. The illegal snap on the offense, number 44, five-yard penalty, still fourth down even considerably different than what it was with Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts is not the type of passer, natural passer, that Tua Tonga Vailoa is. So the RPO game, it was the offense, it was really the approach that Nick Saban lamented against. You know, he called it a scoring fest. Is this what we want football to look like? All of a sudden his team's doing it really as good if, if not better than anyone else in the country. Yeah, if you watch the Alabama LSU game a few weeks back. It resembled what we used to see more in the Big 12. A back and forth, explosive plays, especially in the downfield passing game. So to be able to get Nick Saban to change his mind about anything, impressive. And here's his head coach talking about what this past week has been like. Look, I've talked to Tua. I, I'm, I feel bad. I'm hurting. All right, but so I call him on Saturday night to cheer him up. He cheers me up. I call him last night because I've been sitting in that room for 10 hours yesterday watching film. I call him to cheer him up. He cheers me up. I can think back to, you know, four or five players that I actually truly could say I really love those guys, you know, as people. Um, the way they did things, the contribution that they made, how they affected other people. Uh, and, you know, Tua would be one of those four or five guys. Well, no doubt about it. And just like that, Bama strikes again. Jalen Waddle from 54 yards out. And Mac Jones now 9 of 11 for 253 and three touchdowns. And he hasn't had to do a whole lot, honestly. Yeah, no question. What he's had to do is just simply distribute the ball to the playmakers, and that's his number one job. It always is, really, as a quarterback. And go back to what Nick Saban said to Mac Jones on Mac Jones's recruiting trip. You don't have to be exceptional at the quarterback position in Tuscaloosa because you'll be playing with great players. Simply distribute the football, and Mac Jones was recalling that to us yesterday. 
throw it short to a guy like Jalen Waddle and allow his elite speed to do something with it. And it's well executed outside. Kind of the smoke screen, you have the blocker by Jerry Judy of all people up front and then get to the edge. And then Western Carolina just simply doesn't cease to be like this in the Southern Conference at the FCS level. The angles are completely different in Tuscaloosa. Now the Tunga Vailoa family moving here to Tuscaloosa several years ago and to his mother, Diane. Feeling good about this start here today. And it was funny too, we talked with Miss Terry, Nick Saban's wife earlier this week. She said she called the family before Tua's surgery in Houston last weekend. And it was Diane Tunga Vailoa that comforted her the same way that Tua comforted Nick before said surgery. And there's a look at Miss Terry. Met Nick Saban back in eighth grade at science camp. They did a little bird watching for the first time together as we send you back to the studio and Matt Berry. Okay, guys, coming up in the Lexus Halftime Report, we'll have first half analysis of Mac Jones' first start for the Crimson Tide. Plus, we'll check in on Ohio State and Penn State and that boat roaming against Northwestern. Jesse Palmer, Joey Galloway join me coming up on the Lexus Halftime Report. And I'm anxious to hear what the guys think about Alabama. Obviously, the first half performance certainly expected, but moving forward, the playoff possibilities for this team. It's the only program in the country that's been in every single college football playoff. Trying to extend that streak, ranked fifth in the nation by the committee going back to last Tuesday. What's it going to take to get the tide back in? Because I think most people right now are sleeping on this program. And I think it's pretty obvious what needs to happen. Get to that here in just one minute. Is it? Is it really that well, obvious? I mean, to me, it, 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 in the sense, LSU and Ohio State need to do what they've done. Bama lost to LSU. That's not another hurdle that you want to have to deal with come playoff time. Will Jones checking in at quarterback for the Catabouts. Heavy pressure, no surprise, and down he goes. I think it would help Alabama's chances if Clemson were to lose next weekend at South Carolina or maybe in the ACC championship game. And then I think the big one is this. Out of the Pac-12, can that league's champion have two losses yeah. and as well as the Big 12 champion too? I think that's the key. I think the Pac-12 and the Big 12 have to have some chaos ensue with Baylor and Oklahoma as well as Utah and Oregon. I just don't see that happening. What Alabama really needs is to get down to comparing the loss because then they, they have a chance. They might be able to get their foot in that door a little bit for that four spot. But until that's the conversation, I don't see a path forward for Alabama. Watching SportsCenter this morning, the All-State Playoff predictor suggested if the Tide went out, a 63% chance to enter the playoff. I don't know if that number is something that we would necessarily align ourselves with at this point, but we do know this. Typically speaking, there are surprises late in the year. And the Bama resume, not as strong as what we've seen in recent years because the schedule hasn't been as difficult. Best win against Texas A&M so far. And Texas A&M is the only Power 5 team that Alabama has beaten that has a winning record. And that hurts them tremendously. There goes Waddle, plus territory, waiting on the convoy. There it is. There he goes. Waddle towards the pylon. And bumped out just short of the goal line. No, they'll say that's a touchdown. Check the feed here, Kelly. The referee that's on the goal line did a great job of communicating with the side judge. I think that play is going to come back to about the one yard line. Indeed it is. Clearly stepping out of bounds was Jalen Waddle, but make no mistake, the run itself, <laughs> the blocking in front of him, very oh impressive. Goodness. Yeah, they ought to save some of these explosive plays for next week in the Iron Bowl. 
Well, the freshman All-American a year ago, Jalen Waddell, figures to be the leading receiver next year because you got to think Henry Ruggs the third, Devontae Smith, Jerry Judy will try their hand in the NFL all as juniors. And so Waddle, just a sophomore, will have a chance to be under the spotlight even more in 2020. And Ruggs isn't even playing, and he's the guy with the elite speed. When we were in here earlier in the year, after review, the runner stepped out of bounds short of the goal line. The ball be placed at the three-yard line, first and goal. Najee Harris told us that in a foot race, he might actually take Waddle over Ruggs, which is pretty frightening for everyone else. You can see the foot out of bounds when the ball is somewhere around that three-yard line. Well done on the field by the officials. The head linesman right there that you can see in the screen looks down the sideline to the side judge. And in the end, they cooperated and got it exactly right. Tip of the cap to the old school Alabama out of the I formation. Robinson. And I think he lost the football. Catamounts come up with it. And the Crimson Tide turn it over. So Brian Robinson, the junior, lost the handle on it that time. I think Ty Harris was there by for Western Carolina to get this football. Does it come out either before Robinson gets over the goal line? And I think it does. I think it's about the one-yard line. He's still on a, a pile of bodies, and that ball comes loose. Awfully close to scoring. Ty Harris recovers, Kelly, as you mentioned. First Crimson Tide turnover. After the touchback, Catamounts will take over at the 20, trailing 38-0. Tyree Adams back on the field. And a dump off to Kosinki. Short game. Well, how would you assess what you've seen truly out of Mac Jones? And we know he's made the easy throws, but any other intangibles as a former first-round quarterback that you've been able to unpack? You answer the question first. I was literally going to ask you the same question, and I want to hear your version of it before I wax poetically about the subject. Nick Saban wants him to be a point guard. He's been exactly that in these first two quarters. So I think that's good. I just don't know that he's been truly tested so far. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And that was really the objective of this game, to get Mac Jones acclimated to a game plan centered around his skill set and what Coach Sarkeesian knows that Mac Jones is comfortable with. And so I think that's been accomplished. I think there was the one throw early to Tennyson in the end zone that Mac Jones was a little outside with it when he could have driven it into the right between the two eights of Tennyson. Outside of that, I think he's just executed what was there, and that is what Mac Jones is going to be called to do from this point forward. Time winding down here in our second quarter. You know, Roy, quarterbacking is difficult, no, no question, but in reality, it's the objective is quite simple. Who are my playmakers, and in what fashion can I get the ball to them efficiently? And so that's what Mac Jones has to do going forward. Adams floats it out of bounds on third down, one second remaining. And Catamounts will either take a knee or try to punt this one away. I think the Catamounts are saying, where in the world does one team get all of this speed in every phase of the game? And where you find it is in Tuscaloosa for the last several years under Nick Saban. There aren't many teams like this. 253 yards through the air, 59 more on the ground for the Tide in this first half. And halftime upcoming. Good start for Mac Jones, his second career start. First one coming last month against Arkansas. Nine of 11, three touchdowns so far. Here on Senior Day at Bryant Denny Stadium.
Riptide looking to improve to 10 and 1 as we check in with Lauren Sisler, who has Nick Saban. However you want to do it. Coach Saban, it's been an emotional week for you guys. How did you see your guys respond here in the first half? Well, you know, I think we played okay. We made some good plays. We made some big plays. You know, they're trying to stop the run, so we got to throw it. Max done a pretty good job of that. After we got out of all the different crazy formations they were doing early in the game, we settled down on defense, so we're doing okay. How would you evaluate Max's performance and his ability to manage this offense? He's done a good job so far. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's things we could do better, but I'm pleased with the progress he's making. He's playing with a lot of poise. He's been pretty accurate with the ball, so we're good. Thanks so much, Coach. Thank you. Crimson Tide with four sacks, forcing a couple of turnovers. 38 to nothing, our score. Tide rolling here at home as we send you back to Matt Berry in the studio. Matt, take it away. Roy Philpott, thank you. Lexus halftime report. Jesse Palmer, Joey Galloway, Matt Berry. The ESPN College Football presented by Xfinity. Here at Bryant Denny Stadium, you're watching the SEC on ESPN. Start of our second half here in Tuscaloosa. 38 0, Alabama leading Western Carolina. The annual tune up before the Iron Bowl and on hand to a Tonga Bailoa. Hip surgery Monday, back in T Town on Saturday. Great to have you with us, as always. Lauren Sisler on the sidelines, Kelly Stopper, and I'm Roy Philpott. Interesting first half. Mac Jones, I thought, extremely efficient in Alabama, as dominant as you would expect. Mac Jones was 9 out of 11, over 250 yards and three touchdowns. Distributive football, which is what his job is. This is what the coach, the coaches are going to have to say in the quarterback room. Steve Sarkeesian in particular. Bobbled snap, and you missed a tight end that should have been a touchdown pass. That's the Alabama standard, and that's what Mac Jones now has to live with. And they talk about Bama Factor here in Tuscaloosa. Bama Factor trying to find a way to handle Auburn. A week from now, down on the plains, as we check in once again with Lauren Sisler. Yeah, Roy, and talking to Coach Saban in the meetings, he told us that he talked to Mac Jones and said, you can't be the sparring partner anymore. He said that to him before the Arkansas game and reiterated that this week. You have to be the commander-in-chief, and it's how you carry yourself on this football team, how you respond to adversity, and Mac Jones has really matured on that level, and he even told us yesterday that he feels like he's come a long way. He's learned a lot from Tua in that regard, assessing him, watching how he responds to adversity on the field in practice and in football games, and that is really translating out here today. Nick Saban said he likes his poise and likes how he's managing this offense. An efficient start. Those three first half touchdown throws. This one's going to be picked off. Tyree Adams picked off by the senior Jared Maiden. This is just Tyree Adams really predetermining as opposed to anticipating and letting Adams's eyes really be the final decision maker. Maiden really didn't go anywhere. He stayed right underneath that route the entire time, was not affected at all by the play action. Is really a run pass option in the backfield and Maiden just simply stayed underneath the receiver and caught it right in the chest. Three picks for Tyree Adams, the senior. Mac Jones back on the field to start our third quarter. Play action and looking for Jerry Judy. There he is. First down Alabama. It'll be first and goal from just inside the five. And what's happening right now in the pass game against Western Carolina most likely is not going to be happening next week against Auburn. A lot of times Mac Jones can actually wait for the receiver to break and be open. Many times you have to anticipate and throw receivers open against tighter windows inevitably next week against Auburn. Najee Harris, the running. Why is Mac Jones out there with a 38-point lead? You made the point at halftime to me that it's important to go through a halftime and then to start that next series in the third quarter just from a preparation standpoint. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And so what the marching orders right now for Mac Brown is even though he had his first start against Arkansas a couple of weeks ago when Tua was hurt, now it's different mentally because now you're the guy and you know Tua's not coming back at least this year. Najee Harris with an alley and another touchdown. And so Roy, an important point to make, just like last week, it's standard procedure for 
the starter to play all the way through the first half. So there was controversy around Tua being in the game for that two minute drive. That's a bunch of nonsense. And in this situation with Mac Jones taking over, you're exactly right. You want him to have to talk about it at halftime, make some adjustments, and then come out in the second half and warm up all over again and still be efficient. 45 nothing. our new score. Najee Harris, two touchdowns on the afternoon. One through the air, this one on the ground. Tide rolling here in T-Town. Named after Alabama alum and donor James M. Fail. Graduated back in 1949, the Fail Room. In effect for Western Carolina out of the Southern Conference here today. Trailing 45 nothing. Lauren Sister, Kelly Stopper, Roy Philpott. Interesting conversation during the break. What is Steve Sarkeesian telling Mac Jones here? Well, the pat on the rib protector is kind of some correction and talking about the day in review. The handshake at the end is, young man, you're done, go have a seat. That's exactly what happened there. So I would assume the next time out, we're going to see Talia Tungavailoa to get the backup some needed time as well. Pretty efficient day by Mac Jones. Leah Tungabailoa, the younger brother, of course, of Tua Tungabailoa. A freshman. It's Tyree Adams, the inside handoff for a short gain on first down. And it's important to get your backup guys some quality reps. Iron Bowl next week. Big bowl game, we know, on the horizon. Whether that's the playoff or not remains to be seen. But 5'11 freshman. Has played in four games this year, so if he plays today, obviously no redshirt season. And it's an interesting set of dynamics. We talked about this with Mac Jones. In the quarterback room, you have big brother Tua, little brother Talia, and you have Mac Jones in the middle. And he said it's been fantastic in terms of the relationship that all three of them have with one another. RPO will have Adams keep it for a quality pickup. Byron Young with a tackle. After a gain of five, it'll bring up third down. Talia is a, is a natural passer, and he's very confident and is really acclimated to the lifestyle in Tuscaloosa and in that locker room very quickly. Waiting for his time. Athletic is number five in Crimson. We'll see him in all likelihood in short order. Third down and two for the Catamounts. At the mesh point, Adams pulls it out somehow, throws a dangerous pass, and it's picked off. Jared Maiden, the senior, his second interception of the third quarter after heavy pressure from Christian Barmore. Well, we've seen Tyree Adams in this situation multiple times, and he just doesn't expect this type of pressure. Typically, Adams would elude the pressure out on the edge right there. And when he can't, because of Christian Harris, a linebacker closing in, he compounds the poor decision making. It was started by the pressure initially and then ended ultimately with a bad decision. Tunga Vailoa family looking on. And our first look at Talia. His nickname is Leah. Out of the shotgun. A stiff arm from Harris. Ushered out near the 22. And so the question now is, what are you going to see out of Talia Tungabailoa? Well, more of the same, quite honestly. Steve Sarkeesian said, with a true freshman, less experienced than a Mac Jones, his play calling does change to some extent. There are some things that he just won't expose Leah, too, at this point in time, but you want to see efficient and effective and ball distribution just like Mac Jones. Harris remains on the field, a jump cut inside the 20. Steve Sarkeesian told us, you know, we sit down with our quarterbacks day before the game. We ask them, what do you like? What don't you like? We did that with Talia this week, and it's something we'll continue to do, but he told us as well, it's so important for him to get some reps in this game just in case. Using tempo on second down. Harris stays in bounds and is lassoed it down at the 15 by Jermichael White. And so you see what has happened as we take a look at the Tungo Bailoa family. It's 
it's got to be an interesting set of dynamics. You have Tua recovering from a serious injury down on the sideline, and then you have his little brother that now taking snaps for a football team that still has an opportunity to make the college football playoff. Pretty unbelievable set of circumstances. Nalu and Diane move to Tuscaloosa after Tua. Signed with the Crimson Tide. Another easy touchdown for Devontae Smith. The screen pass nets 15 and six more points on the board. The thing that you see with Western Carolina is when you come to balance and stop your feet against speed, you lose the race. And that's what we've seen multiple times. Western Carolina defensively can typically get away with that in the Southern Conference at the FCS level. You can't get away with that here, and we've seen it multiple times this afternoon. Full of us on for the extra point. It is up, it is good, and the first career touchdown pass for Talia Tungabailoa. Gotta feel good for the talented freshman. Penalty flag on the field following the extra point. We'll check the infraction as Alabama increases its lead once again. After the play was over, unsportsmanlike conduct on Western Carolina number eight. That 15 yard penalty will be enforced on the kickoff. That is number eight's first unsportsmanlike conduct foul of the game. Devlin Olawumi, the guilty party. 10-32 remaining. Here in our third quarter, Ty Lee, big. So the freshman Leah on the left, Tua, the upperclassman on the right. First touchdown pass completed just moments ago from Talia Tungabailoa to Devontae Smith. And you know, a massive sense of pride, both on the sidelines here at Bryant Denny and in the stands with Diane and Nalu looking on their parents. Fifty two to nothing our score with Lauren Sisler Kelly Stopper Roy Philpot in Tuscaloosa now the Tunga Bailoa family you have a beach Hawaii to enrolled in Alabama back in 2017 and the entire family moved out here to Tuscaloosa shortly thereafter Talia enrolled here the Crimson Tide two years later earlier this year in 2019 so the entire family on hand showing support as you would expect from all the stories we've heard from Lauren and from folks that have covered this program for a number of years and there Nalu and Diane in the stands as we speak Adams off the back foot the short game and close to a first down Lauren you've spent a lot of time with the Tunga Bailoa family over the years what are they like yeah, I was fortunate to make the trip over to Hawaii uh, back in May of last year and just spending time with them was so interesting. Just seeing the culture and just how they operated as a family. It's just a big family atmosphere. It's faith, football and family and that's through and through. And you know, a lot of people always wonder what's the difference in the personality between Tua and Talia and just kind of watching him when Talia came to Hawaii a couple days after his brother was already there. He was a little more reserved when we first met him. He kind of sits back, takes everything in around him. But once he's comfortable in his environment and with his surroundings, he's cutting up and having fun as you would expect as a freshman in college. Now, I'll tell you, being in Hawaii is a very eye-opening experience. It's great to learn that Samoan culture. It's so clear that faith and family are at the forefront of their everyday lives. And it's really never been taken for granted. And that's been so apparent this week, every time I've talked to the family and the faith that they have exuded through this process while they're in pain, they're uplifting everybody else's spirits. An amazing story indeed. We heard those sentiments echoed by Nick Saban, his wife, Miss Carey. And even Mac Jones in a FaceTime conversation with Tua Tungavailoa while he was still in Houston shortly after surgery back on Monday. And that really is the the chore now with Coach Saban to move this program forward when you know that at the very least Tua is out for the year. And so it's not only what you lose on the field in terms of X's and O's, it's his impact in the locker room. 
on and off the field with his teammates, he elevated everyone around him, which is that position's number one responsibility. And just because another quarterback takes snaps, they don't automatically own the locker room like the former starter did. That's what needs to happen going forward now. Adams with a play action fake. Another dangerous toss that was nearly picked off. Josh Jobes, so I'll ask you this question. He has 32 school records. The runner up to the Heisman Trophy just a year ago. Won the national championship coming off the bench supporting Jalen Hurts back in the day. Any chance at all that he would elect to come back to school for one more season or does it just make too much sense to go into the draft next year? I think it makes too much sense and I think that was probably written in stone when this season began but who knows I mean this injury really turns everything upside down in terms of kind of the the timeline and when two is healthy once again extraordinary player there isn't any question about it the ever dangerous Jalen Waddle flag on the field and a couple of spin moves after a punt of 37 yards he'll get it back to the 44 let's check the penalty I think he pressed the X button a couple of too many times there. During the return, personal foul, illegal blindside block on the receiving team number 10. 15 yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. Pull back to guilty party. 8 12 remaining in the third quarter. Timeout on the field that have matched up with Ohio State have told us this is the best team that league has seen perhaps in decades with Kelly Stoffer, Lauren Sisler, I'm Roy Philpott here in Tuscaloosa, the Bama, or Bama rather, fighting to get back into the college football playoff. Buckeyes are a different team this year with Fields, that defense, Keelan Robinson off right tackle. They're a factor, make no mistake about it. A factor? <laughs> Yeah, there isn't any doubt. I think the committee has viewed Ohio State as the best team in this, in the country, although LSU still looms at the top. So it's, it's pretty interesting the way this is gonna play out down the, down the stretch. One through three, I think, is stacking up quite nicely in the minds of most pundits around the nation. Passes incomplete, looking for Slade Bolden. LSU one, Ohio State, Clemson. And when you get to number four, that's where the opinions start to differ in a significant way. I like Oregon in that spot right now, followed by Bama and Georgia. You've got the Bulldogs in. Yeah, because of who the Bulldogs have beaten up to this point, and the losses really aren't the separating factor between Georgia and the other one losses. But it's. LSU, Ohio State, Clemson, and I think Ohio State can actually jump LSU in the coming weeks with some marquee matchups, including Michigan coming up, and obviously what they do today against Penn State. Tyrell Shavers with the grab is second of the season. Talia is getting the message that it's about distributing the football to, to guys that can go up and make plays like this. That wasn't extremely well thrown. Maybe a little bit conservative, high and slightly inside, but Shavers goes up and high points it and makes the quarterback right anyway. It's a gain of 20 yards. It's the Shavers Mac Jones connection on the scout team in the last two years that drew a lot of fanfare. The Alabama media this past week, and the notion was that. Mac Jones kept completing bombs against the first team defense to Shavers. Nick Saban goes his direction and says, hey, why don't you stop completing passes to number 14? And he said, why don't you find a way to stop us from doing that? Yeah. <laughs> but that demonstrates the swagger of Mac Jones. We asked Nick about it. He said, I don't remember it. But Mac said, yeah, I don't remember it either, but it sounds about right. I've had those conversations with defensive coordinators running scout team, and sometimes it gets a little chippy. <laughs> Busting through is Robinson. Keelan Robinson towards the end zone for another Alabama touchdown.
from 46 yards out. That'll be the second of the freshman's career. Keelan Robinson does a great job late down the sidelines, keeping inbounds, and once again, another explosive play by the sheer speed and athleticism of Alabama just being really difficult next to impossible for Western Carolina's defense to do anything about. Mac Jones, the new leader in the locker room, feeling good about that Robinson score. Bam on top, 59 to nothing. We're back at 60. Well, what a week for Tua Tunga Bailoa, making it back to Tuscaloosa after hip surgery on Monday, watching his brother throw his first career touchdown pass moments ago. And now exiting the playing surface at Bryant Denny, perhaps for the final time. Coming up later tonight, Justin Herbert, number six, Oregon, look to keep their college football playoff hopes alive against Arizona State in Tempe, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC, also the ESPN app. And right now, according to ESPN draft expert Todd McShay, Herbert, the number two draft eligible quarterback. And correct me where I'm wrong, I think he has actually moved up in front of Tua Tunga Bailoa, along with Joey Burrow up at the very top, considering the season he's had. Yeah, I think it depends on who you talk to, but I think Justin Herbert possesses probably the most NFL-ready skill set. And certainly the injury to Tonga Vailoa, the Tua Tonga Vailoa, matters in that draft coming up. Here's Adams for Western Carolina. Bolts ahead for a first down. And a gain of 20 yards. Now the current top draft eligible quarterbacks, according to Todd McShay, led by Joey Burrow, Herbert, Tonga Bailoa, Fromm, and Jacob Eason. Joe Burrow, how much ground has he covered this season? Some people now think he's the first quarterback taking off the board. I mean, who would have thought that ahead of Tua Tonga Bailoa coming into this season? Well, for those wondering, and we're no doctors, but the thought is here in Tuscaloosa, it's going to take about three months after the hip surgery on Monday for Tua to kind of get back to where he needs to be. And at that point, rehab process is accelerated. And there's no question a team is going to look at his skill set, all the records set here at Alabama, the national championship one coming off the bench in impressive fashion. And just the way he spins it and say, I want to draft him in the first round. No doubt someone will want him on their team to be the face. I mean, what better face of your franchise at the next level if indeed he does come out than Tua Tonga Bailoa? My question is this. He's, he has that reputation of being a tough quarterback. There's a time when the tough quarterback mantra turns into injury prone, if you continue to stack up those injuries, we'll see what the next level thinks about that. Back to the studio and Matt Berry, Matt. All right, guys, interesting story developing between Harvard and Yale. The game is currently in a delay because there is a student protest sit-in at midfield on climate policy. This took place at halftime and has delayed the start of the third quarter because students are having a sit-in protest at midfield of Harvard-Yale. Well, you don't see that every day. <laughs> no, you certainly don't. Appreciate that update. Here at Bryant-Denny Stadium. 59-0 our score. So in your mind, back to the Tunga Valoa conversation for just a minute, you mentioned the injuries. Before the dislocated hip last Saturday in Starkville, the thought was he's got a real opportunity to be the number one overall pick. Can he get back to that position showing scouts 
later next year that he's fully recovered because by all accounts that's the expectation yeah and in terms of where you're drafted it affects the money greatly in terms of the signing bonus I think that's really where it is you only need one team to be in love with your skill set to make you their first choice in the first round and you can see the injuries are beginning to stack up the index finger the sprained knee the left quad the two ankle surgeries and then certainly what we saw last week in Starksville so I've been on the table before where you're stripped down to your briefs and every doctor in the NFL for every team examines anything they want and so Tua is going to go through that but when does that begin you're talking about a hip dislocation and a posterior fracture of the hip socket that isn't just your mundane everyday stuff in terms of an injury there is a lot of rehab to be done by that young man flip out to Spencer who's tackled by Daniel Wright that'll be a Western Carolina first down so a lot to be determined between now and then in the recovery process but I'll tell you this I know he's not the tallest quarterback in the history of college football but the stats that he was able to produce the national title one the records that were broken his intangible qualities leadership ultra impressive but Kelly the way he spins it yeah is a thing of beauty a work of art if you will easy to fall in love with his accuracy the tightness of that spiral yeah, and I think now it's the health question is something that needs to be answered much more than what he does on the field I mean there are, is a boatload of game action with two of doing remarkable things and you can come to practice over the last couple of years and watch him throw and it's majestic and the timing is impeccable so now it's I think more about the health side of things and when is he healthy and what's the status of that hip going forward. Second down and nine Western Carolina threatening. Catamounts did move into Alabama territory in their first three possessions only to end in turnovers. Is that pass batted down. Well to a tongue by low everybody remembers off the bench the national championship comeback win in overtime against Georgia the runner up for the Heisman Trophy the following season 32 school records for Tua Tunga Bailoa and well before that moment in the national championship game which a lot of people thought was his coming out party there were already all kinds of stories watching Tua Tunga Bailoa throw side by side with Jalen Hurts it was only a matter of time before his story started to be told and now we know it on third down the handoff ahead to the 20 it'll bring up fourth and about five for the Catamounts well there were rumors going around even in Alabama's win against Clemson in the Sugar Bowl yeah. before beating Georgia that he could be a weapon off the bench that college football had not yet seen for the Crimson Tide injured player you think about the Crimson Tide under to a tongue as Christian Barmore is banked up the offense really hit a different gear yeah this is what I we talked about earlier in the week as a production crew is this to me is the transcendent part of the young man is Nick Saban wasn't playing football this way there wasn't the gaggle of RPOs during a game and spreading things out and it was a power game and it was a lot of two back sets and and now Tua shows up and it's maximizing that player's skill set and that's the result right there so this is my question going forward is if Tua isn't at the controls of what we see on the screen right there does Nick Saban in a sense turn the page back to some extent and start playing offensively like maybe he once did. I don't know that you find Tua's skill set on every street corner in the country. A transcendent quarterback as we let our show off today. Christian Barmore walking off without assistance. That's a good sign. Should point out for Alabama, 
the entries at linebacker obviously well documented but for today DJ Dale at nose Raquan Davis at one end and Phil Mathis all out as the tide gets ready for the Iron Bowl next week Barmore walking off under his own power that's a good sign but injuries whether you like it or not have been a key story for Alabama defensively this year and that should conclude our third quarter 59 nothing our score 15 minutes remaining here on senior day at Bryant Denny Stadium an emotional week concluding for Tua Tunga Bailoa moments ago. Taking in the action, watching his younger brother throw his first career touchdown pass. Tied in command. Second half, right now it is 21 14. Nittany Lions coming back. Julian Pletz here in Tuscaloosa connects. The 38 yard field goal to put Western Carolina on the board. 59 to 3 just underway in our fourth quarter. And Roy, you know what I'd like to do now is take a look at today's hardest working player brought to you by Duluth Trading Company. Xavier McKinney was ripping it from the get go. A couple of interceptions, recovers nicely down the middle of the field. He's somewhat fooled on this one, catches the ball up in the air and then knows what to do with it. And then a highlight that you don't see very often is going to be a, a play. He bats the ball back to a quarterback and then ends up sacking the quarterback after that. That's a series of highlights that we probably won't see again this year. While forcing a fumble. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how that's even going down into the <laughs> stat line. You bat the ball on a blitz. The quarterback catches it. You chase down the quarterback and force a fumble. And you've already gained two interceptions, the second of which you took all the way back. In basketball, we call that stuffing the stat sheet. Indeed. A lot of people still watching this one just to see what Alabama looks like before the Iron Bowl next week. Our friends in the desert highlighted a Crimson Tide as about a double nickel favorite. And what you know, it's Bama leads by 56. Keelan Robinson straight ahead. And crossing the 35. Well, don't forget about Sports Center from LA later tonight after Washington, Colorado with Stan and Neal. We'll have plenty of reactions from Penn State, Ohio State, plus Herbie's take on Oregon or Utah's place, the upcoming college football playoff, plus Lakers Grizzlies post game coverage. Sports Center after college football on ESPN also. The ESPN app. Have you seen the Lakers and LeBron James oh this my year? Goodness, yeah. They're fun to watch again. They are. It's amazing. And Best LeBron, record. you talk about being the distributor of the ball. That's LeBron this year. Leads the NBA in dime strikes. Yeah. The assist man, LeBron James. Leah Tungavailoa back on the field, replacing Mac Jones, who had an extremely efficient outing. There goes Keelan Robinson into Western Carolina territory. Michael Murphy prevented the touchdown. That's going to be a gain of 20. Keelan Robinson is another true freshman. It's true freshman quarterback given to true freshman running back. And this Robinson has a little giddy up in his step. St. John's High School in the Washington, D.C. area. Same high school as Alabama teammate Terrell Lewis. 18 yards per touch so far today. Bama approaching 500 total yards as Robinson stacked up for no game. Ricky Paleo got there. Injured Catamount near the 40 yard line. And a timeout on the field as we step aside. Introducing. Well, if you're just tuning in, a big afternoon for the Tonga Bailoa family and our Lauren Sisler caught up with Tua in the first half. I'm feeling good. You know, I, I think first off, I just want to want to thank, um, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for, I mean, you know, instilling the Holy Spirit in me, giving me the strength to come and support my teammates. Um, I also want to thank, you know, the fan base uh, for the amount of support that they've given me and my family. 
um, as well as prayers. You know, I want to thank the pastors as well, and I just want to thank my mom and dad. Um, you know, they've been helping me throughout uh, this process. You know, if I need to go use the bathroom, they help me go use the bathroom. They help me make my food. They help me go get drinks. So, um, you know, kudos to my parents, you know, for everything they've done for me up to this point. And you know, I just can't thank everyone enough for the amount of support that they've given me and my family. Whether I'm feeling good or, or not, you know, just being out here kind of uplifts my spirit, you know, and, you know, I hope it does the same for them. But, I mean, just being out here, being able to see football again, and, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just great. It's a great feeling. Well, great stuff from Tua. Nalu and Diane looking on still in the stands as Tua's younger brother, Talia. Tunga Bailoa remains on the field, replacing Mac Jones. Mac Jones finishes afternoon 10 of 12 for 275, three scores. Leah two for three for 35 yards and another touchdown toss as well, the first of his career. Here's Keelan Robinson again, the featured back so far in our second half for the tie. Alabama at number five in the latest college football playoff rankings. Knocking on the door of the top four. And in need of some help in all likelihood to reach the playoff for the sixth consecutive season. So approaching 12 minutes of play. It is that time of year where it's kind of fun to look at the resumes of all those teams competing for the top four spots, Kelly. And we love to play this game looking at the blind resumes between four programs and trying to pinpoint who's where and we'll show you here in just one second but the point of the matter is when you remove the names on the jerseys sometimes it kind of clarifies who should be where yeah and there we have it Georgia is out in front of those other three teams because of who they have beaten up to this point. And the conversation has not yet turned to the quality of loss. And so that's what Alabama is up against in the four teams that we saw right there, all one loss. But Alabama really doesn't have that statement really lying ahead of them. They have Auburn next week, but outside of Texas A&M, they haven't beaten a power five team yet that has a winning record. The Auburn game significant because Auburn defeated Oregon way back in week one in a neutral game played in Texas. So if we get to the final selection day on that Sunday and we find out it's Alabama versus Pac-12 champion Oregon sitting there with one loss. And if Bama has defeated Auburn soundly next week, especially on the road, that is a check mark in favor of head coach Nick Saban of the Crimson Tide. I'm not telling you that that will decide who gets in and who's left out but it's one data point that would give Alabama a chance to be in the playoff Jerome Ford picks up a first down and is stopped at the 13. yeah and in that scenario if you get Oregon that wins out and beats Utah which will be a top 10 win you have Oregon having two things that Alabama doesn't have a top 10 win but also a conference championship and strength of schedule and conference championship in the final say of the committee is going to be looked at greatly and way more than who you lost to. Translation, if you're a fan of the Tide watching right now, how does our team get in? I think the best possible scenario would be to have the Pac-12 champion end up with two losses. No question. And then that really opens the door for the conversation. I think if Clemson loss either at South Carolina next week or the ACC championship game that could also open the door for Alabama and others from the Big 12 or Pac-12 to sneak in at the last minute. So the outcomes that help the Crimson Tide, I think LSU, Ohio State claiming those top two spots at Clemson loss, as we just mentioned, but the two loss champion from the Pac-12 and Big yeah. 12 makes a huge difference. No question. And Oregon is playing against Arizona State tonight, and Utah has Arizona. Those aren't layups in that conference, although Oregon and Utah both are playing extremely well right now. So if they go into their conference championship with one loss, 
I think it creates a roadblock that Alabama can't overcome. So if you're a fan of the Tide, you're watching ABC tonight at 7.30, and you're hoping yes. and praying for the fighting Herm Edwards yes. to pull off an upset against Oregon. And he's done a nice job with the Sun Devils. They've really had has. their fair share of upset wins in just a couple of seasons in Tempe. Not exactly explosive offensively, but playing really good defense. And anytime you play good defense, you have a chance. I mean, Nick Saban and Miss Terry, no doubt they're watching that game tonight, <laughs> right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Miss Terry's going to go for that. Jerome Ford towards the pylon for the touchdown. Third of the season for the redshirt freshman from Sefner, Florida. Question is whether Jerome Ford penetrated that pylon he has to take the ball inside of that pylon or hit the pylon and I think this is certainly going to be a score but Alabama just continues to roll out guys to carry the football and the results the same one of them's going to end up in the end zone sooner or later. Bull of us extremely busy afternoon connects on the PAT. 66 to 3, Bama. Santa Claus, Bill and Mary. On this Saturday, the exhibits are a Waterford Crystal Houndstooth hat, which commemorates the coach's headwear and the Daniel Moore painting used to create the postage stamp, which celebrated the life of one of the all time greats who is recently now tied with Nick Saban. Six national championships claimed, and Nick Saban hoping perhaps get at least one more if not more than that by the time it's all said and done and now we take a look at this blimp worthy play brought to you by our good friends at Goodyear Mac Jones was ultra efficient today 10 out of 12 275 yards three touchdowns the last three games that he's had a chance one start against Arkansas relief in the second half against Mississippi State and he did this same thing by the way 34 out of 44 over 600 yards and six touchdowns get the ball to your playmakers in space and good things happen if you're a quarterback at Alabama Western Carolina with the ball trailing by 63 so I'll ask you this numbers look great against Western Carolina Arkansas Tennessee etc for Mac Jones Marlon Davidson, Derek Brown next week yeah. down at Jordan Hare Stadium. What's it going to look like against that kind of defense? Yeah, a different uh, task altogether. And I think that's it. I think it's Kevin still scheming against Mac Jones as opposed to Tua Tungavailoa. Kevin still, the defensive coordinator at Auburn, still has to worry about the playmakers out on the perimeter and Najee Harris. And Mac Jones is a very wise young man to just say, how do I get the ball to my guys where they can do something with it? And if he does that next week, I think Alabama will be in good shape. Always a good time in the Iron Bowl. Auburn coming into that one at 7-3, and 4-3 and three in the SEC, and they're dispatching of Sanford over on SEC Network as we speak. The win against Oregon, one of the best in college football this year. Close losses, and that's been a consistent theme in recent years under Gus Malzahn. And if you're a fan of the Tide, you like that vibe going into that game. Yeah, and Auburn certainly likes to be at home. And those three losses are a total of 21 points. The second most difficult schedule in the country. I think Texas A&M has the most difficult schedule in the country. But Auburn, by and large, have been forgotten about. And they're only a Nats eyelash of being right in the thick of this thing. Adams off the play action fake. It'll be fourth down. Think about the Aggies of Texas A&M for a moment. They close the season later today against Georgia and then at LSU next week, having already faced Clemson and Alabama. Not an easy task for Jimbo Fisher in just his second season in College Station. No, but the thing that Jimbo Fisher has is his 
his roster is starting to look right as he transforms that and recruits extremely well into that place. And they have gotten better last year and this year down the stretch. Kellen Mond starting to come on strong at the end of the year for Texas A&M. We'll see what that means later today. Shavers nearly blocked the punt. Nick Saban looking on his team in control. Bonus. Back in Tuscaloosa, you're watching the SEC on ESPN. Alabama dominating Western Carolina as expected. Lord Sister Kelly Stopper, Roy Philpott on senior day would be remiss if we did not mention three juniors and a sophomore. Three of these players may be playing their last home game. Jerry Judy, Devontae Smith, Henry Ruggs III, who's out today, and Jalen Waddle. Waddle, we know, is going to be back. The other three probably are done after this game in terms of home tilts for the Crimson Tide as Lockridge goes off right tackle. Yeah, Judy Smith and Ruggs are all draft eligible, no question. And Judy is a consummate route runner. I mean, and knows the purposefulness of the play. And Devontae Smith has great hands, yards after catch. You talked about it. 610 led the nation coming into this season. And then Ruggs is just elite speed. He's a little banged up. He was a game time decision. Obviously, you can see Henry setting there. And then Waddle is fast and has good hands and is good out in space. He might be the best all around guy in that in that group. But he's a sophomore and you know he's going to be back. Well, you think back to all the great receivers that have played here in Tuscaloosa, especially within the last 10 to 15 years. And only Amari Cooper has caught more touchdowns than Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs III, and Devontae Smith. So it's been a different era with Tua Tunga Bailoa, but Judy, Ruggs, Smith, you can match those guys up against just about anybody that's played here. Yeah, there isn't any question. And you can remember earlier in the year, the story comes out about the rock, paper, scissors. Who's going to get the football? Who needs a touchdown? And, you know, who has that luxury in college football? It, it doesn't exist many places. Towns to the running back with real estate along the left side and a nice cut. Tripped up crossing the 45 of Western Carolina. Jerry Judy, we believe, will be the first receiver off the board come April in the NFL draft. What struck me when we watched Alabama for the first time in practice a few weeks ago, unbelievable route run. It just, as a former quarterback, just made me very envious of anyone throwing to that young man. In and out of breaks, doesn't have any wasted motion with his feet, great separation. He's kind of slight, but trust me, that dude's going to catch a lot of footballs at the next level, whenever that is. Paul Tyson, the new Crimson Tide running back, Wearing number 15, Townsend plunges forward to the 40. Bigger fish to fry coming up next week down on the plains as Alabama and Auburn renew their rivalry once again in the Iron Bowl. The other thing about that, that matchup is you really have a youngster in Bo Nix taking snaps, and he's never played in this game before that's coming up. Mac Jones hasn't played in that game either and so it's really going into that game is which quarterback can play the cleanest and distribute the football to the guys that can get it done. Bo Nix has had several incredible moments this year including that win against Oregon he threw the game winner with just seconds remaining as Tyson hands off Paul Tyson the quarterback for the tie Bear Bryant's great grandson. Mac Jones now on the sideline. Steve Sarkeesian told us yesterday the biggest asset, asset that Matt Jones has going for him right now is the understanding of the scheme. People forget that Mac Jones decommitted from Kentucky knowing that Tua was coming here and Jalen Hurts was already here. So as a redshirt sophomore, he's been in the system. He understands it where the plays fit together and the constraint plays or the complementary plays that come off the base plays. And then it's about execution and distribution. And so far, so good for Mac Jones. Under three to go. Won't be as many matchups like this in the SEC in the month of November in the years to come. It's been a popular topic of conversation on Sports Talk Radio around the conference. 
will have a different feel next year, but for this season, it works out well for Alabama getting Mac Jones some much needed reps as a yeah. starter and giving Steve Sarkeesian and Nick Saban the ability to see how he can respond in that setting. And now with two starts under his belt, more momentum in their favor next week. Yeah, and this start is different than his previous start against Arkansas. We talked about it. The mindset as the starter, knowing that you're going to be the starter going forward, is completely different than just being the starter for a game or two, let alone being the backup that comes in in a critical time or in the second half of a game. And so this is the first for Mac Jones. He's never been in this position. He now has to be himself, as we've heard from a lot of different people. Don't try to be Tua because you're not. But the commonality is Tua knew how to get the ball to his playmakers as well. Play clock winding down. And a timeout called by the Tide. 89 seconds remaining here in Tuscaloosa. Back for more after this. 30 Eastern Saturday night football. Oregon and Arizona State. Number six Ducks trying to keep their playoff hopes alive. Led by quarterback Justin Herbert. And a look at the notable one-loss teams, including Alabama Crimson Tide right in front of us. And what Alabama wants to have happen is Georgia loses and then chaos ensues behind them where it comes down to analyzing the one loss that you have and depending on who that is you know if there's chaos in the pac-12 then it might be analyzing the one loss with oklahoma as an example let alone minnesota penn state penn state's making a go of it now against ohio state as we speak Oklahoma, the Big 12, trying to get back into the mix as well after the Sooners were upset in the Little Apple against Kansas State last month. And Jalen Hurts, a former Alabama quarterback, may have something to say about all of this. The, the issue with Oklahoma is to go on the road and beat an undefeated Baylor and you really get no pop in the polls, so to speak. That doesn't bode well for how the committee thinks about that conference currently. What a week this will be for Mac Jones and the Crimson Tide. Now in victory formation, getting ready for the Iron Bowl. Trying to position themselves as best as possible for the upcoming college football playoff, knowing that help is needed in all likelihood. The play clock did not get reset. We will play for it down. There is no foul for delay of game. Michigan and Indiana coming up. We're done here in Tuscaloosa. Jim Harbaugh. An offense back from the dead, it seems like, in recent weeks. That's going to be a fun with the Hoosiers. No, no walkover no, this year. No question about that. Playing pretty good football. An emotional week winding down. I feel exhausted. It's been a lot. Talking with Coach Saban yesterday was eye-opening for me. He was still raw and hurting. So what you saw several days before on the podium or at the podium, it was every bit of that and more with us yesterday. One more snap, that'll do it. Tide will improve to 10 and 1. Iron Bowl coming up. Western Carolina falls in its final game to 3 and 9. Mark Spear, Nick Saban shaking hands midfield. Catamounts pick up. $525,000 check for this appearance, which no doubt helps their athletic department in Bama. What amounts to be a glorified scrimmage gets the victory. Lauren Sisler with Nick Saban. Lauren? Coach Saban, you come out here with a 66-3 win over Western Carolina. The resilience of this team facing adversity this week. Explain that to me and describe that. Well, you know, I'm glad. I'm happy for our seniors. You know, we wanted to come out and have some fun today. So their last game in Bryant-Denny Stadium, it's great for our fans. We appreciate their support in supporting the senior class. Uh, but we, our guys executed pretty well today and played pretty well. But, you know, it's all about what we do in the future. So, you know, hopefully some of the things that we did today will help us next week. You said that Mac Jones needed to come in here and be the commander-in-chief. How do you feel he alluded to that today and obviously the confidence that it gives him moving forward? Oh, I think he did a good job. I thought he played well when he had to, when he played against Arkansas, and you know, so 
Yeah, I'm sure he'll learn some things today, and we'll learn some things about him as well. Thanks so much, Coach. Thank you. All righty, and we got we got Mac Jones here. Mac, 10 of 12 today, 275 yards, three touchdowns. How are you feeling right now after getting a big win over Western Carolina? I feel good. I mean, it's all about the team, though, and they did a good job rallying around me, and we made plays, so that's what we're here to do, and we just want to grow off this game and continue to work. And to the seniors, congratulations to all the guys that got in, and it was fun to see a lot of young guys and old guys get in today. So. What can you say about the resilience of this team after the emotional week that you guys faced? Yeah, I think it, it shows a lot. I mean, we trained for things like that all year and mentally and physically, so we're, we're ready for anything. And uh, we just got to put our, put our head down and work, and everything will be good. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, his nickname in the locker room, Baby Brady. And in his two starts, he has been Tom Brady-esque. Six touchdowns, no picks. Tua Tunga by Loa and family on hand here today, as Lauren indicated. An emotional week concludes in Tuscaloosa. 66 to 3. Our final score with Tua on hand just days removed from hip surgery, repairing that dislocated hip. Big performance for his younger brother and for Mac Jones as well. Once again, the final 66 to 3. Bama beats Western Carolina. Coming up next, college football scoreboard. So long from Tuscaloosa. ESPN thanks you for watching this presentation of the Southeastern Conference.